so we I think we've probably got enough people to say um, that uh, we've got a good turnout. So uh, let's uh, kick off. Thank you all for coming to um, this uh, PTIC meeting. Um, this um, is more is is quicker. Um, than, uh, than we would normally have following requests last time because there's so much going on um, that uh, it would be sensible to uh, to have um, another one uh, sooner rather than waiting to uh, October. Um, so um, we're going to try and keep this one shorter than uh, than PTIC sometimes is. Um, it can become uh, slightly rambling and long-winded if we're not careful. Um, so, um, minutes of the last meeting. Thank you to Teresa for putting these together. Must be the most comprehensive um, set of minutes that uh, PTIX or, or <laughs> ever had, and uh, and Stuart was <laughs> pretty good at uh, <laughs> long minutes. So, uh, yeah, it helps with the video, doesn't it? <laughs> You're muted, Teresa. Yeah, okay. Well, um, so um, if there's these, what right? These went out on Monday on the new email list. Um, if you've not got them, then have a look in your spam folder. Um, and if you still can't find it, um, let me know because we've got a new email distribution list. Um, the previous one was being run by um, Travel Line Southeast. Um, and um, as Stuart is, uh, is leaving the transport world, um, we were gonna lose uh, access to it um and it only seemed right to uh to, to move it and have it on a patent controlled um um system so uh, apologies if it's gone into spam and and you're not getting the um the the emails but um let me know if you've not got it and i'll try and work out what's gone on yeah i didn't get it um even even at 12 38 or whatever Teresa said um I got your other email um, about the meeting and uh, the one about the new list, but not not the minutes. I'm afraid. Right. I don't know what went okay. wrong. Cheers. Yeah. These things always take a bit of debugging, unfortunately, to work out why. <laughs> e email's a bit of a mystery sometimes, I think. Um, okay. So if there's any matters of accuracy um on these um let me know let Theresa know and we can correct them um in terms of actions um there was a call um to action for authorities in particular um about um NAPTAN and updating NAPTAN um, and getting in contact with KPMG um, and um, helping um, the BODS team engage with small operators, um, particularly if you're currently producing trans exchange for them. Um, Then there was the next ones um, were um, was Giuseppe asking for information about how different authorities were creating NAPTAN um, and um, sort of feedback on two potential. Um, routes for generating it one on a timed basis overnight or another one um sort of on the fly um and um 
views on versioning, um, but we can pick that up uh, later on the agenda when we when we talk about um, NAPTAN um, because uh, things are moving quite quickly. Um, then um, there was an action for me to set up a separate um, NAPTAN session with um, the NAPTAN project team. Um, we've not done. I've not done that yet. So um, I will get on to that. Um, linked to NAPTAN, but more to do with um, the accessible information um, regulations, which are uh, on the way. Um, setting up a task and finish group to look at stop announcement names. Again, we'll pick that up later on the agenda. Um, and Transport for the North were wanting feedback on um, Siri SX that they've been publishing as part of the uh, their disruption messaging tool. Um, unfortunately, um, Richard's not uh, able to join us today. Um, and um, they were also after bus operators in particular to get involved in the user research for FAIRS tools. Um, so I don't know whether any of the operators that were involved last time got in touch, unfortunately. Okay, so those were the actions in the last um, minutes. Is there anything else on the last minutes? No. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, Okay, next up, um, we've got Mira, I think, yes, um, from the DFT, who's going to give us an update on uh, on where they are with BODs. It's been quite a busy uh, few weeks for BODs. Um, <laughs> a lot of things happening, so, uh, yeah, Mira. You're muted. Sorry, just switching off to me. Um, hi, and um, yes, I am happy to give you an update. Um, I'm just sorry, just working out. Um, can anyone tell me how to share my screen on um, GoToMeeting? So I'm less familiar with this than I am with um, Teams. Oh, hang on, I might have figured it out. It's one of the options down the bottom. Um, if you move yeah, your mouse to this is yeah. just near the camera, I think. Yeah, you can see it now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, your desktop. Desktop, yeah. You can see my desktop. Oh, that's a bit embarrassing. You shouldn't be able to see that. Um, I'm just trying to um, share my slides. So I've got a P6 yes, slide can see there. That now. You can see it. Yes. Oh yeah, of course. Okay, that's brilliant. Right, I'm just going to present and then I'm um, happy to give you an update. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm just going to switch my camera off as well. Okay, um, so, so yeah, so, so we're in um, July 2020. Um, we have, um, yeah, we've um, had quite a busy year so far actually um so we started here launching bods um as a public beta service for timetables only um so that broadly has gone well we're working with the industry to iron out creases and to to identify what works and what doesn't work from a publishing flow perspective um but obviously as many of you know in march covid happened and um yeah, I think ministers in Baroness Vera in particular decided that bus open data was absolutely one of her top priorities and this had to continue going at the same pace. So we've been very um, fortunate that the team have continued to go at the same pace. Um, however, we have also been doing quite a lot of work on um, COVID as well. So we've had additional work come to the team. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick canter through what we've been up to. Sorry, uh, my slides have just been a little bit slow to transition. 
Um, Okay, here we go. Okay, um, so this is just a very quick summary of how the service is doing so far. Um, so um, we had 39 registered bus operators at last count. I've got a feeling that's actually increased because last week we've really um, just started to push um, from the 13th of July um, what the West Mids area and registering operators for BODs in the West Mids area. Um, but we do definitely have 22 publishers um, so you can actually see that if you go into bus, um, find bus open data. Um, four of the publishers are big five operators. So we've got first Arriva Stagecoach and National Express. Um, sorry, first Arriva Stagecoach and Go Ahead. And National Express will be publishing ahead of the statutory deadline, but not until September. They're just waiting for Omnibus to deliver an export and validator that's compliant with BODs, and then they'll deliver. Um, they'll, they'll publish their data in a BODS, um, using the BODS profile. Um, so we've got four big five operators, they're almost national data sets. Um, so there's a few anomalies, um, areas that the, the operators are working um, on at the moment, so updating the transit exchange data, et cetera. And I think the other thing that's a real focus at the moment is um, just sorting out the publishing flows as well, and just making sure that we can automate those publishing flows and, and um, operators can integrate um, BODs with their business as usual processes. So, um, I think a few of you are aware we've been working on a kind of an end date issue uh, with the service to, to, to work out how to um, enable um, operators to publish multiple um, services in one file um, without one of the services disrupting the entire file. Um, but anyway, I won't go into that level of detail, but um, we, that has been probably one of our are they, are they all Are they all regular, publish are they all regular publishers, um, Mira? Because I know Centrebus, Centrebus in Leicester, last time I looked, which might have been a month ago, they'd only mm -hmm. like put one data set in, uh, you know, yeah. ages ago, months and months ago, and, and, and they hadn't updated it since. They may have done in the last mm -hmm. month or so, but I, 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 I would be surprised um, yeah. with the amount of work, rework they've been doing. Yeah, so I was so just wondering when you say 20 to 22 publishers, does that really mean... 22 up-to-date publishers or just 22 people who've published at some point? Um, yeah, so the point I was making about working on the business as usual flows, i.e. enabling automated publication of data, is speaks to that point really. That, so so um, we've got 22 publishers of data and um, there are some who are regularly and routinely updating their data when they're using the, the trans exchange and um, the, the, the upload feature and they're creating their trans exchange file. Um, as a, a, a an open document um, and then uploading it, yes, I think you're probably right that um, the BAU process is is um, being ironed out currently. And actually, to be honest, the same applies for the URL linking because because we need to 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 handle this end date issue, which we have actually identified a solution for now. Um, the, the we've got 22 operators to publish it, but as I say, we, we are working with them. To integrate this as BAU, so that they can automatically update the data and routinely update the data. So that that's the big priority at the moment. Um, so since the service launched um, earlier this year, so back on the 28th of January, we've had 3,778 unique visitors. Um, so that has, yeah, I think when we looked at this, so, so we captured some stats or created one of these slides back in April, and that was in the hundreds. So, so it's really um, picking up in terms of the numbers of visitors coming to the service. Um, we've had 6,351 sessions, so the number of visits, two pods. And um, the average session duration has really dropped actually um, which I think is a good thing and um, that suggests to me that um, operators are much more familiar um, navigating their way around the service so, so initially this back in April this was at five minutes and 49 seconds now it's about three minutes and 20 seconds so so that is um, yeah it, it's quite reassuring but I suppose um, the caveat there is is that um, it, you know, People can do different things in a session. Um, a session does not necessarily mean that you're you're publishing your data. Um, so there is a little bit of um, a caveat to apply there. Um, so I can see comments are coming through. Um, I'm just going to add a, a quick note now, just to say that um, I'll go through the slides and then I'll take questions and comments at the end, if that's okay for everybody. Um, so this is just a, a visual that gives you a sense of where data is being published at the moment. Um, and you can see some of the points that I was raising about how 
you're, so we're primarily working with the big five at the moment to help them establish their business as usual publishing players and that's because um you know obviously if we can get the big five publishing data routinely to bods and, and being able to update their data routinely then we we've got about 75 percent of services covered and then we can take our time and have a longer lead time for the medium and smaller operators um, but this just gives you a sense of the coverage of data um and, and where, where we have data so you can see that um, if you look towards the bottom, we've got less in the southeast um, and also kind of in the Sussex area, we seem to have less there um, and quite a bit less around East Anglia as well um, and in the southwest. But in the, you know, obviously we're, um, more, more is coming through in the Midlands, which is great, and the north is doing really well as well. So, um, and also the, the, we've got um, data coming through in the far southwest too, um, so we'll be continuing to update that. Um, and so you just, just to give you a sense of the timeline, um, so we've just literally launched quite a, um, so, we, so we've had to think, rethink our business change plans slightly. And um, so we were planning to put together a team that went out and, and um, delivered business change activities with the industry in a face-to-face -face manner. Um, any of you who are familiar with the Street Manager project might recall some of the, the, the um, business change activities that the Street Manager um, team delivered and so we wanted to do something quite similar to that. Um, obviously COVID um, put paid to those plans um, so um, we have rethought our plans, we're working digitally and remotely with the industry to support business change. We will put together a face-to-face -to -face team and um, it'll be next year now probably after just around the spring um, hopefully once we're past the worst of COVID and past social distancing. Um, but we will need to continue to review that and actually in hindsight we think that's not necessarily um, a terrible place to be in the sense that we can do what we can do this year remotely and digitally see who is going to be able to publish their data and then that quite intensive support that wrote the, the, the team who go out and provide face-to-face -face support can focus their activities next year and um, when we're actually requiring three different types of data to be published and so there's probably more value to gain from that team then um, so we're, we've just launched from the 13th of July um, a business change um, plan, which takes us up until the end of the year and will likely be extended until March of next year. Um, that focuses on the 87 local authorities across England. On a month by month basis, we'll be targeting different regions and the local authorities within those regions. So at the moment we're in the West Mids. Um, that's, been a big, that's been a big focus over the last um, week or two. Um, and what we're trying to do here is get operators to register for BODS and start publishing their data before the statutory requirement and certainly before the autumn. Um, so um, we'll continue to offer that support during 2020 and through 2021, but the, the nature of the support will likely change in 2021. And um, the conversations we're having with the industry and with DVSA um, and ATC or around um, essentially supporting the industry through this change during 2020 and during 2021. Um, DVSA will pick up, um, so, so they'll be much more actively involved next year. Um, so I, um, the, the sponsorship of DVSA for buses and taxis sits within my team. Um, and at the moment we are engaging with them on a monthly basis and briefing them um, on a monthly basis as to how BODS is, is um, being rolled out and how the operators are doing um, in terms of um, registering and publishing their data. Um, DVSA will be on hand to provide support to operators when they go out and do, do visits, etc. Um, and then as I say from 2022 onwards we expect um, we, we, we'll, we'll obviously still continue to offer support but the, the tone will change slightly. I think it'll, it, it, there'll, there'll be much more of a focus on compliance um, from 2022 onwards. Um, we have some of you will know we've just made the regulations anyone who's familiar with the legislative process will know it's um it's not quick um and so um we've had we had our debate so i'm going to provide a bit more detail about the the regs um so so we'll come to that in, in due course um but i think the key things to note here are that from the 31st of december 2020 and um, the timetables requirements will be legally enforceable um from the 7th of january 2021 the first requirements will be legally enforceable and then um, similarly the same date for the location data requirements and from the 31st of March 2021 operators will also be legally required to provide historic punctuality reports 
Um, now, normally that would be for the last 12 months. Um, in this instance, on the 31st of March 2021, it would just be for the last three months. And we are providing functionality within the bus open data service to enable operators to provide that data. Um, so that will most likely benefit the small and medium sized operators. And I think some of the bigger operators have got their own software that, to provide that um, data, but it'll be available to anybody to use. Um, and I suppose the other thing that's um, worth noting for this group particularly is that there will also be a legal requirement for the maintenance and updating of stops data, which um, we haven't honed in on here. Um, and so, and, and I, I do work quite closely with Giuseppe's team who have the the, the, the brief for NAPTAN um, because it's a multimodal data set rather than just a bus data set um, or just a local transport data set per se, which is the remit of my team. Um, but there'll be a lot of support for, um, for local authorities to maintain and update their NAPTAN data. Um, at the moment, my team are, are helping local authorities update the um, and improve the, the base NAPTAN data in their own um, NAPTAN systems and then feeding that into the central NAPTAN database. And um, Giuseppe's team are doing a lot of work, actually, to, at the moment, primarily um, provide a, a, um, a data quality tool for NAPTAN um, or data quality service. Um, and then also to, um, in the longer term, provide an updated NAPTAN service that hopefully will enable um, local authorities to connect to the NAP central NAPTAN database via APIs and just really speed up those update flows. And I think that'll be a, a, a big benefit. Um, but you've got a really capable team there um, in Giuseppe's team, very digitally adept. Um, and we, yeah, only yesterday they were demoing the, the open NAPTAN um, service to it, which is really, you know, genuinely quite exciting stuff. Um, okay, so this is just um, our timeline for BODS. Um, so you, um, we, uh, many of you will know, last year we were delivering our timetables private beta. That went into public beta earlier this year. So at the moment, for the timetables publishing service, we're in a public beta, which means that operators can use the service. They can publish their data. Um, but we are also working very closely with those operators and with the industry to understand how those publishing flows are working. Um, what's not working and making sure that those issues are, are ironed out. Um, at the moment, we, we are engaging with data consumers and they are playing around with the data and they're, they're having a look at the data. Um, I think it's really from the autumn onwards that we'll start to see data consumers really starting to use this data seriously in anger with um, their own applications, products and services. So it's very important that we do iron out those issues um, with the, the publishing flows and with, with the service before then. So that's our big focus at the moment. Um, location data, um, yeah, really excited about location data. This is the, the, the real, this, this is where we have the potential to drive real transformational change across the sector and do lots of exciting things. Um, team have been working really hard actually since January of this year, so basically ever since they launched timetables, they're straight into location data and they've stood up a test site for location data. We've got 17 operators publishing their data. I think first have got the most feeds on there at the moment, which is great. 35 opcos and just really generally good coverage. A big, big focus at the moment is making sure that when that service goes from test to a production environment, so it's actually a live environment, that we migrate all of that data that the operators have published straight over into the new live environment and the operators don't have to do anything um, additional. And um, because really those operators who are becoming early adopters of this service should be incentivized to do that and rewarded to, for doing that, not penalized by having to do it all twice. So that that's the discussion we're having at the moment, making sure we do that. Um, Burr's data, um, yep, this is a really, uh, this is a fun one. Um, so um, Burr's data is, um, we, yeah, we're really fortunate and lucky to be working with TFN, um, who have a really good team around them to deliver the Fur data build tool. Um, that's taken along quite nicely. Um, we work very closely with the TFN team, um, and at the moment they're just sending test files through to the BODS team. Um, the BODS team are testing those files in the first um, beta service, um, so we're in a private beta at the moment. Um, we have just literally this week started to invite um, um, uh, publishers and consumers to start using the FERS um, data service. So again, a test site similar to location data, um, but the, the location data test site has been running since the middle of May, whereas the FERS test site has only just 
um, being opened up now for testing with operators and, cons um, and data consumers. So that is very exciting and um, still quite a lot of work to do, to be honest. Um, it's probably going to be the, um, the most interesting or the most complex of all of the different data types. Um, but again, real change um, to be driven through the, the open publication of FERS data, which is great. Um, and the intention is to, to have completed all of our service assessments. So we're about to go into a really crunchy timetable now um, of um, accessibility audits, security assessments, pen tests, and then GDS mock and live assessments. And that'll take us up until the autumn of this year. And the intention is to have cleared all of those successfully by the end of October. And that gives us a couple of months to comfortably launch the service before the stat requirements come in at the end of the year. And in um, and particularly for first and location, 7th of January. But really, as soon as we're, we're going off for Christmas, um, that, that's, that, that's the end of the, the time that we've got to get that service up and launched. Um, and we are expecting media scrutiny again, um, possibly not the same level of media scrutiny, given that um, we, we won't have just passed a general election, um, or maybe not, who knows. Um, but um, the, you know, I think generally, um, you know, from our perspective, it's really important that where we've got a statutory requirement coming into effect, we do have an implementing service um, to, to enable operators to, to, to meet those new requirements. Um, stop data improvements, I mentioned a little bit about the work that we're doing with the local authorities to improve the, 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 the NAPTAN data. So we estimate there's about 4% error rate based on passenger mm -hmm. figures and also um, corroborated or verified by ETO. Um, and so we are working um, with local authorities to improve the, 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 the base NAPTAN data and, and address the, the, the most common errors. Um, we have also included a reporting and analytics service as part of BODS. I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail as we go through the deck. Um, I suppose key things here are um, we want to um, ensure that we fully realise the benefits of opening up this data and the benefits that go beyond um, data consumers building apps for passengers. Um, so there's that the, 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 the role you know, whole abundance of benefits here, local authorities being able to use the data to support route optimization, transport planning activities, traffic management, um, the um, operators being able to use this to support the punctuality monitoring activity and also um, the um, ability to, to kind of see see the network coverage of their location data, which is going to be generally quite hard to monitor. So we do need to make it easy for um, the operators to monitor that. Um, we um, also see this as a real opportunity to digitally transform the way DVSA um, delivers some of its um, statutory functions. And so, so we're working really closely with DVSA and that, you know, they had a good session with them yesterday and they're genu genuinely really excited about um, the potential that the reporting and analytics service brings to um, digitally transform some of their roadside monitoring activities and just give them a whole network view and um, give them a much more um, objective evidence base um, upon which to determine whether there are punctuality um, compliance issues and also going forward, BOD's location data compliance issues as well. So that's very exciting. Um, and then, and, and actually just finally on the reporting analytics, the other area for change here is around the statisticians in DFT. Um, so we um, have, you know, some of you may or may not be aware, we have a huge statistical function in DFT. Um, we um, provide lots of different statistical releases and reports and have different ways of capturing data ranging from some quite sophisticated mechanisms to some quite cr um, crude paper-based mechanisms. Um, and um, what we want to do is as well use the reporting and analytics service to digitally transform some of those surveys as well. So for example, the first survey. Um, so, um, and then the next, um, and so the reporting and analytics modules will be released in, in blocks um, over over the coming um, months. So with the first block being released, um, so that'll be the live location data feed monitoring by the end of the year, punctuality monitoring by March of next year. Um, and then there'll also be a module around enhanced vehicle data and statistics, which will come in the summer. Um, the integrated transit models and that the next piece of so during the transitional period, we will provide data consumers with a full data set um, for timetables. It'll be provided as GTFS um, and they'll be given options for other versions of transit exchange beyond 2.4. Um, the 
the, the other thing to note here is that the location data, um, so obviously it'll be required by operators to be provided to Siri VM, but through the integrated transit model, we will convert that data into GTFS RT, which is really what the data consumers have been asking for, um, really from the point of public consultation onwards. Um, it's really important for benefits realisation that they um, have um, a complete data set as quickly as possible so that we start to deliver some of the benefits quickly, um, but also that they have it in the data formats that work for them, um, because ultimately this is about you know, d d um, driving technological innovation and, and stimulating the trans tech sector. Um, so. Um, so that so the integrated transit model, um, the GTFS um, conversion will be available from the autumn of this year, and then the GTFS RT conversion will be built up slowly as we um, take more and more Siri VM into the service. And that's why we're really focused on trying to get as much Siri VM in there as possible now, um, and having a smooth um, migration from production um, from test to production. Um, and I talked a little bit about business change phase one, um, and that will continue um, definitely until the end of the year, but likely until spring of next year. Um, Tim, how are we doing for time? Conscious that um, it's 10 o'clock yeah, now. We, we could probably do with five minutes, maybe 10 minutes max. OK, um, that's fine. So I'll just do, I'll just go to the progress update um, and I'll just pick out the key thing. A lot of these things I've actually already spoken to um, here. So I think probably um, points that we've not really raised just yet was we're doing quite a lot of work with the upstream data um, on upstream data creation and working with the technology suppliers and making sure that basically when the operators have statutory requirements coming into effect, they actually have the means to, to meet their statutory requirements. So the timetable suppliers, trapeze, Omniopti, et cetera, are providing exports that are compliant with BODS, um, with the BODS profile, um, BODS Trans Exchange 2.4 profile. Um, and similarly, we're working with the ticket machine suppliers to make sure that they are delivering their NetX exports as well. Um, and then um, also um, working with the ticket machine suppliers on the Siri VM profiles too. Um, I think at the last PTIC, I think Jonathan Raker asked if um, we asked for an update on the Siri VM profile and the documentation. And I think at that point, the profile was complete, documentation wasn't complete. And so, yes, today I provide final sign off on the documentation. So, we're just putting up we'll see Tim knows there. Um, so, we're just going to put banner ring on that and then I think once we've completed the, the, the group. Um, yeah, I think I've talked a little bit about the regs being made. Um, yeah, I suppose the other big focus is the industry's worked really well um, to deliver capacity and crowding information during COVID and that's been really important and valuable. Um, so we have seen an extending of the peak um, through to about 11 o'clock in the morning um, as people return to public transport. Um, DFT has recently just changed its message, or I say DFT, H, it, it's actually a government message about the use of public transport, which has been quite controversial and not particularly helpful for a sector that has really, you know, one, been a key lifeline to many people during COVID, but has also um, suffered quite a bit as a result of COVID due to having to run still half of the services, but only with 10% of customers. And so we have been very keen to move to a position of supporting message, supportive messaging um, for the sector, but at the same time, having to take that line with um, the, the government position on COVID as well and, and um, the acceptance that public transport does carry, using public transport does carry a degree of risk for COVID transmission. And so we have been able to move to a position of more supportive messaging. Um, there's a bit of nervousness about September when the children return to school and we're expecting about a third of people to return to workplaces. And so we are really keen to make sure that that capacity and crowd and data goes beyond just being available on operators apps and is being made available to Google and the big app developers. And we'll look to expedite that through BODS. Um, well, I think, to be honest, I think the, the only other thing that's probably worth noting is the team are at the moment really focused on delivery engagement mode functionality for BODs, and that will enable local authorities to publish data on behalf of operators should they choose and wish to. Um, and that functionality is expected to be released around the autumn time. Um, there's 
the location data service which should be released as public beta in the autumn time and we'll also um, publish updated implementation guidance at the same time and that's probably all i need to say i think thank you mira that was uh, very helpful um got a question from mark jones about which team will monitor operators and liaise with those that haven't maintained their bods data sets um yeah i think that's a really great question actually and thanks for asking it um so it'll be a mixture of, of and teams so say so the, the business change phase we're kind of working with both local authorities and dbsa but primarily monitoring and compliance and, and the statutory responsibility for, for monitoring and compliance sits with dbsa as say um my team um have the sponsorship brief for dbsa for buses and so we work very closely with dbsa actually we we, we always have quarterly meetings but at the moment we've really stepped that up and we're having monthly meetings with dbsa um, so it'll be a combination of um, you know, both the, the BODS team um, looking at what's happening across the sector as a result of business change activity and what we can see in the service, but then also working with DVSA who have the, the examiners out on the ground who say can provide that support and also to, just try and understand what's actually happening, what's the issue here, why isn't an operator publishing the data and what do we need to do to, to resolve that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, are there any more questions for Mira? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of okay. the things that um, we've been um, doing um, with um, BODS um, is, is working on trying to, to help manage um, issues um and um so you'll have seen something um even i can't share or oh, forgotten how to share uh, on go to meeting um <laughs> so uh, where are we um that one so um there is a process um in place now um, for a weekly update cycle for issues for BODs um, and um, as PTIC members feel free to submit issues through to uh, me uh, those of you in Artig you've been sending stuff through um, as well um, the operator digital initiative is feeding in um, as are travel line regions and TIL, um, all into um, travel line who are producing um, a issues log on a uh, on a weekly basis, and then sharing that with uh, Mira's team to um, try and help them um, be able to focus on some of the key issues um, and not get too flooded by um, lots of uh, little things from different people that are the same um, and then that gets fed back out and uh, and we get um, an update um, uh, the um, following week so um, when it hits you Mira um, uh -huh. how does that feed into the work that you're doing with KPMG and ETO um, yeah, no, I think that was a great question. Um, so we have a regular slot at our Tech Tuesday, and so we spend about 45 minutes just going through the issues list. Um, so I do have um, updates and uh, monitoring the progress of the team um, in terms of issue resolution. And so usually the discussion that we'll have at that Tech Tuesday is um, this is the issue that's being reported. Um, and, and first of all, just trying to understand from the service team what, whether they perceive that to be an issue, right? What, what's the plan here? It, um, is this about um, not not knowing how to use the service properly at this stage in time, just needing a bit of assistance to um, navigate the service properly, or is this functionality that's in development but hasn't yet been released, and so is it due to come, or is this actually something that we need to do that we've not yet done, and we need to add this now to to 
um, the dev backlog and the public beta. So that's generally, they, they usually fall into one of those three categories. Um, and so there's a number of, um, there's a number of points that have been raised that are um, functional as your features that are in development. So, so actually the team have become aware of them because the team are delivering user research and we have a business change team who are working on a one-to-one -one basis with operators. And so there are a number of issues that have been surfaced through other channels that are actually in, um, being addressed. Um, and then there's a couple of points that have um, been surfaced um, through, through that process that are novel or new um, that we weren't aware of and that, that are things that we do need to, to, to resolve or address. Um, so, 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 so when I have a, a um, that meeting and then update the issues log with updates and then the following week I'm just keeping a track on how, how the team are doing and what their plan is to engage with the operators and to to share with them the the, the new functionality and test that. Okay thank you. Um, so the sort of things that are being captured um, are things that are issues as, as Mira has said um, they might have already been picked up elsewhere or worked on but also questions sometimes um, uh, we can get those uh, answered um, very quickly because somebody else has already answered them so we don't need to go back to bobs um, mm -hmm. requests for change so you know wouldn't it be nice to have type um, functionality and uh, and comments and observations and um, you know, um, if, if you actually really like something and you think it works well then that's actually really important, useful feedback, um, as much and as and as useful as uh, this doesn't work because uh, that helps the team know that they're going in the right direction and doing the right sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, I would say that actually, Tim. Um, thanks for and um, thanks for pointing that out. Um, so, so we really value the constructive feedback, the what we call it formative feedback that helps develop the service further and improve it. And I think that is really important, particularly at the moment, because we want to have completed um, or addressed all issues by about September of this year. Um, I think at the same time, it's really, you know, the team do take, they, I, mean, I mean, first of all, I would say we've got a really capable and skilled team working on the service. Um, and they are investing huge amounts of time and energy and effort in, in, into um, the delivery of the service and engaging with the industry. And I think it's just really nice when they get, they do, you know, really respond well when they get that little bit of feedback from some of the operators. And I think the data consumers actually are, are the ones who are really, um, you know, doing, doing um and I suppose it's because the data consumers are the winners here in the sense that they're getting something that they didn't have before and they're not having to do a lot to get that. And so, you know, it is important to have that frame of reference and to understand that. But at the same time, um, I think it does help the team if they're, if, if, if they're aware of actually which features work really well in BODS and, and, and therefore, you know, we'd want to see those retained, um, but also understanding actually what what's a real nightmare here from a publishing flow perspective because it's really important that the publishers that the operators have a very smooth journey and that they can publish their data very easily and it doesn't feel um, like a hassle having to go into bods and do this it, it should it, it should just um yeah just feel very um intuitive and, and straightforward yeah so um if anybody um has anything um any issues or or any uh feedback positive um or or negative preferably positive um then a, mi um, a mixture <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it has to it has to be the truth <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah um then uh then then feed that through um to me and i can uh, i can get it into the uh into the chain to uh to, to be fed to uh to the team um and we can uh, and we can get a response back for you um Tim, uh, even if you if... think somebody else has mentioned it and and raised it you know oh, somebody else must have found this actually still send it through because that does actually help mm. us work out whether something is uh, is really important mm. or not um and help prioritization of things 
Um, yeah, so uh, don't don't be shy. I think is the is the thing um, with this. So Tim, if it's helpful at the next session, um, I'd be happy to just provide an update on the issues list and and. Because I think by the time you have the next PTIC meeting, we should have actually yeah. um, have worked through quite a number of those points. So that might be a good point at which to provide an update. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, OK. Um, one other question about BODS's implementation group that's come through. Um, is is that going to restart in some form of remote um, approach? Yeah. So, so we are planning to restart the implementation group. Um, so we paused um, the paper open boards and implementation groups during COVID because as I said, the, te the team have been, um, well, so realised we haven't been very outward facing during that period. We have actually been really, um, we, you know, they've been delivering boards, but then at the same time, delivering the capacity and crowd and solutions as well and we're still continuing to deliver capacity and crowd and solutions um so so I did want to provide that context um we had the first program board um for uh, about four four months and well certainly since february of this year so about five months um last week and that um yeah it worked well digitally actually and um, so i think we're all agreed that we'll continue to run those digitally primarily um but the next one of those will be in september now um and then i think once we've delivered the, the service we'll start to look at um whether we need to have them more regularly particularly as we move into a benefits realization phase um the implementation group i have um we have no plans as such yet to restart implementation groups but we will be restarting implementation groups i should say that um, so I would expect that to be around the September time as well. Um, and then um, we'll probably look to run both programme boards and implementation group once every two months from that point onwards. Um, but I, I think at the moment, the team's focus has absolutely had to be delivering the regulations, delivering the COVID solutions that have needed to be delivered. And that now making sure that we've got both first and location data functionality ready launched and bods um, before we get to the statutory requirements and then we'll start to get back into um, governance um, that they could um, probably have bad yeah every two months governance channels yeah okay um, thank you um, one of the um, things that uh, Mira talked about as being imminent um, was the um, location data profile. Um, some of this has been shared um, previously, depending quite on which lists you've been involved in and things like that. But we're now at a point where um, actually there's enough certainty about what it's going to be to to share it more formally. Um, and so um, the mandatory elements, um, so the bits that of Siri VM that have to be um, populated um, are now um, bottomed out. Um, most of these are fairly um, expected and um, easy to deal with. Um, a couple um, we know might cause some um, challenges. Um, block ref um, for operators is potentially challenging for the smaller ones that aren't used to using running boards and things like that. Um, but it's really important um, when it comes to location data. Um, but and the other one um, that's on this list um, that's also in bold um, destination arrive aimed arrival time. So um, pretty much everybody has the um, origin, so the start departure time, because that's um, very regularly used to help journey matching. Um, fewer people um, currently populate the, uh, the destination arrival time, um, but uh, for a number of data consumers, that's really important and useful. Um, and helps save them having to do a lot of other um, matching with uh, 
with scheduled data. So um, between block ref and destination aimed arrival time, I think those are the two that are going to cause suppliers and implementers probably the most um, challenges. But the data's there, um, so hopefully it's just minor tweaks. Um, a lot of the rest of the stuff um, is all sort of scheduled data. Um, there's very little live in there. Um, things like vehicle ref and the location um, and the time of, of, of that location um, are pretty much about the only live things. Um, the rest of it all links back to um, uh, what the vehicle is uh, planned to be doing um, to help journey matching. Um, and because a lot of it links back to um, a lot of the schedule stuff, um, in the documentation, um, it says where you, they're going to get that sort of stuff. So producer ref, um, that's actually unique to where the source is. So this is this is one that I can see having a bit of confusion for people. So um, if you are producing Siri VM, um, then that is who who is producing it. Um, if you're aggregating from a number of different sources and then supplying into bots. Um, actually that needs to be um, the source and that needs to be passed through um, rather than being changed to um, whoever the aggregator is. Um, and that's how a number of people work at the moment. So there's a bit of a change there, but that's necessary to help track back where this data is um, being sourced from. Um, in case of uh, any problems, um, it's then easier to, uh, to to get that resolved rather than having to uh, to go through uh, third parties to to ask where it's come from and that sort of thing. Um, so that's that's one to watch. Uh, vehicle ref, um, vehicle number plate. Um, a lot of the time at the moment, that is um, fleet number or something like that. Um, but BODS is going to want a vehicle number plate. Um, that helps a number of lookups to do with different vehicle types and things like that um, for people so they can do some innovative and, uh, and exciting things. Um, vehicle journey ref. Now, this is one that um, links to uh, the Trans Exchange profile. Um, at the moment in the Trans Exchange profile draft document, um, this is an optional um, field, but um, Stuart is uh, in the process of updating it to, uh, to, to show that it's mandatory. This again helps journey matching um, and helps people track back to, uh, to, to the scheduled and the plans. Um, Operator ref, so the operator running a service, uh, as you would expect, uh, that's going to need to come from uh, national operator code. Um, and um, things like the line ref um, need to re refer back to, to what's in the timetable data in BODS. The whole point of, of this is to try and get as much commonality um, an ability to to match um, to make uh, the data consumer's life as easy as possible to properly represent what is going on. Uh, if we make the consumer's lives too difficult, then uh, then we're going to get poorer customer information, um, and so uh, that's why there's a lot of focus on uh, on making sure it matches um, and um, the other source of, uh, of, of data that needs to be matched, of course, is NAPTAN. So where you've got things like origin ref and destination ref, um, they've got to be NAP, uh, at COCOs from uh, from NAPTAN. 
and they've also got to match what's in the uh, in the timetable. Um, and this is where I can see there being some challenges, particularly where authorities are providing data on behalf of operators. Um, typically, um, that data is, is coming from registrations. Um, and if an operator is making little twi operational tweaks to, to maximize vehicle efficiency and things like that, um, that doesn't need a re-registration, um, but it does affect um, sometimes the uh, the ability to uh, to match data. Um, and so, in particular, we go back a slide. Um, vehicle journey ref um, and the um, uh, block reference are things that typically wouldn't be available at registration. Um, but will be needed in the VM and will need to match what is in the timetable data. So, uh, so there's a potential challenge there, particularly for for data um, brokers and agents um, that are that are doing things on behalf of uh, of operators. Um, so that's probably the other challenge to watch out for. Um, in terms of frequency updates, um, vehicles have got to update their positions at least every 30 seconds. Um, I think that the highest frequency that will be acceptable is every 10 seconds. Um, I don't know whether um, somebody can confirm that or not. Um, but uh, we don't want data that's too stale and old um, but we also don't want to um, effectively do a denial of service onto uh, onto bods by having a, an update every second when uh, that's not needed um, but if you are providing an update of say 20 seconds which is not unusual for a lot of ticketer customers um, then even if the vehicle's stationary um, and not going anywhere. Um, we're still wanting an update every 30 seconds, just to know that actually that bus hasn't stopped working. Um, yeah. That actually it is stationary and not doing anything. So Tim, um, if it's helpful. So on that point about the 10 seconds. So so 30 seconds is the the maximum limit. So say for example, you go beyond the 30 seconds limit, then you, that would technically be a compliance issue. Um, so although I'm sure um, we'll, we'll have discussion with DVSA as to at what point it tips into um, uh, yeah, at the duration and, and how far beyond 30 seconds it tips into um, an enforceable compliance issue. Um, the 10 seconds point, now I wasn't aware that we had set limits on, on um, because I know that, for example, Hogia were talking about their systems actually being able to update data much more quickly than 10 seconds. Um, mm. I'll I'll raise it with the BODS team and check um, whether um, BODS would reject data that's faster than um, every 10 seconds, but that wasn't something that I was aware of that um, we would reject it if it was faster than 10 seconds per se, but it would definitely be a compliance issue if you go over the 30 second point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the yep. 10 seconds came from some conversations with uh, with some of the, the technical um, team uh, a couple of weeks ago. So um, In the BODS team? Yeah. Yeah, okay. If it's come from the technical team and the BODS team, then I would trust that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll confirm it because I, I, I'll need to be able to, to verify that going forward. Um, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, if it's come directly from the BODS team, you have to trust that information. Sorry, Nick's uh, just, raising his yeah, hand. Just, just to flag that it is obviously highly desirable uh, to reduce the time interval over time. Uh, 30 seconds is there for legacy reasons because comms used to cost a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All those things are coming down. And yes, we've been working with Hogia, um, who do a lot of work in Sweden, where yeah. they get uh, updates every two or three seconds. Uh, mm -hmm. The huge advantage is obviously the great granularity of that. 
30 yeah. seconds if the bus is moving quickly you can actually miss out a stop um and because mm -hmm. of not spots across the uk actually what yeah. you already get is a terrible sort of data dump of uh, mm -hmm. where the vehicle was a while ago which really messes with the thing and I, i've been out on the street doing surveys for hertfordshire and seeing the impact of this where you know the you, you do not get clear downs, which is very frustrating for, for people at stops because the mm -hmm. bus doesn't clear down on the RTI, but the bus has clearly left the stop. And you're left kind of wondering, okay. well, is there another bus coming? Have I missed it? So mm -hmm. actually granularity is, is very, very desirable. But I appreciate that, you know, we had to start somewhere. Mm. Okay. okay. Well, I think it's really good to hear that, Nick, and thanks for the feedback. And, uh, you know, I think, um, so unfortunately, um, I'm sure you, you'll know this, being, um, having been a civil servant yourself, um, you know, legislation has not necessarily moved as quickly as technology, but there's absolutely opportunities to go back and to rethink the legislation if, if actually we see that the industry is moving at a pace where they can deliver this data much more quickly than 30 seconds. At the moment, our readiness assessment suggests that, that a significant proportion of the industry will be able to meet yeah. 30 seconds, 15 to 30 uh, seconds. Absolutely. I'm, 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 making, I'm issuing a commercial for the future. Yeah, great. <laughs> sure. no, that's really helpful. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm aware that um, the, some of this um, hasn't been exposed before. Um, to people, so um, are there any questions people have got um, on what I've just been through? Do they feel right? Um, documentation will be out very soon. Um, it's just been um, I's dotted and T's crossed at the moment. No? Okay. Excellent. Um, okay. Um, in terms of trans exchange profile, um, the, the guidance document for that has been out for um, a number of months now. Um, Stuart is in the process of um, uh, working on a, on an update to that to uh, just clarify a few things from feedback um, and um, block ref and vehicle ref will become mandatory um, but other than that um, I think that the next version when that comes out um, pretty soon um, won't be significantly different um, has, has, has anybody tried to, to use the BODS trans exchange profile? Um, any of the uh, suppliers that might have any helpful feedback? No? Okay. It, it, the more feedback we get on these things, both trans exchange and Siri, the better because uh, if we're not getting it then uh, then we're working in a bit of a vacuum and just have to assume that what we're doing is is right and that we're perfect um, but we know that we're not perfect um, so uh, it does worry us when when we get nothing back okay um, I think one small comment there, Tim, sorry yes, to interrupt. I, th I think part of um, this feedback with um, the BODS Trans Exchange profile is, is possibly the standard situation that we always seem to have when something changes in Trans Exchange, which is that it's seen as a bit of a moving target. So speaking for myself, um, until I see a version of the um, PTI profile that doesn't say draft on it, um, I'm not inclined to invest lots of time in using it, um, especially now that I've heard that some of the fields that weren't mandatory are becoming mandatory. I mean, you know, while stuff is changing, um, how much are you expecting suppliers to actually be trying to implement a moving target? Um, if we can get even a version 
that we think is the final version out to people that doesn't say sort of version 0 point something and draft all over it then maybe people will be inclined to to give some better feedback because they'll actually see that it's it's happening and it's real and it's a it's a version you know that, that's likely to be the final version yeah okay i mean that's that's fair that's fair um the 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 challenges and and until we've got some feedback it's quite hard to know whether it is worth making something final and draft to put out because people want comments it's a bit of a catch-22 really it's, it's um, the usual chicken and egg thing isn't it um you know i, I will start to to use uh some of the bods data i, I have i've done a little bit of work on it I'm, I'm able to read it from bods and process it and it you know it's obviously it looks like trans exchange it's fine but um you know some of the more detailed experiments that i would want to carry out on it i'm i'm not really starting that until i know that the profile's fixed and of course most of what's on there at the moment doesn't respect the profile anyway in fact i'm not sure if any of it does um so it's it's difficult to to actually do anything with that as a consumer of the data and um, perhaps it's more down to the producers um who are already uh contracted to the, the bus operators to to give that feedback yeah so okay. um i'll just speak to that point quickly if that's okay tim so the point about yeah. um, so um thanks for your comments rob really helpful um and i think the point about um the servers not respecting the profile at the moment um so i think that's quite an interesting point that you raise um so that is um, a directive that's come from DFT. Um, so we have asked for the profile to not yet be integrated into the BOD service because at the moment, the, the, the um, so I did mention a point earlier on about the technology providers, so the, the timetable software suppliers, and we're working with them at the moment to ensure that they've created or delivered the exports and validators that are compliant with the BOD's 2.4 profile. Because yeah, at this stage in time, um, it, there wouldn't really be much point in us um, rejecting files in boards that aren't compliant with the board's Trans Exchange 2.4 profile if the operators don't have the means of creating the export. Um, so it's really important that the operators have the means to create the export and the valid um, to, to have have the export and validator so that they can create the compliant file. And then at that point, when we're confident that the the tech suppliers have delivered those exports and validators, and that the the operators have integrated that with their BAU processes, then at that point, that's the point at which we'll say to um, the BODS team, actually, now we need to ensure that the service rejects files that aren't compliant with the BODS profile. And we are having those discussions at the moment as a team, and we're quite happy as a team that we can, we can align BODS with the profile. Um, it's just, it is literally just a question of timing. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of timing, somebody has said that a supplier is working on on a new export and import now um, with a possible uh, release date in September um, but that was before um, the uh, today's um, uh, discussion about block ref and vehicle ref so um, I mean that's good to, well I think to it's... That somebody's working on on a test version so yeah yeah it's worth making the point um, that all of the major um, timetable software suppliers and um, so in particular trapeze and omni who between them have the majority of the market have committed to delivering their exports and validators for the autumn um, optia or optibus are also working on an export and validator and they're engaging with the bods team and um, and what i would say is is that the 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 offer to engage with the bods team um because at the moment the source code um for the BODS um, Trans Exchange Validator isn't openly published. We're in the process of openly publishing that. And um, so we are writing to the timetable software suppliers to say to them, if you'd like to get in touch with the team, take you through the source code and, and give you access to the source code. Um, but the major ones have committed to delivering an export and validator for the autumn. Um, Opti have also committed to delivering that because now they're serving first. Um, so, so we're quite, you um happy with the, the plans that the supply that the suppliers have to provide to provide those compliant exports mm -hmm. yeah okay excellent any more on 
trans exchange can i just ask a question um tim um mm. I, I, it might be it might be a it might be something i should already know so apologies if i've if i've uh, not done my homework which may well be the case i just haven't got time um in terms of um the data that goes into bods particularly even just basic timetable data the the amount of where does the checking come in where does that happen in terms of um the correctness of what might be being published because i'm speaking from the point of view of, of trying to manage a, a real time system in leicester whereby um the data will particular data from particular operators and particular suppliers i won't name often has many errors in it that have to be um corrected every time new data comes in because the same errors recur on a regular basis so we're talking things like missing stops like all stops disappear apart from timing points um destinations dynamic destinations uh get dropped and so it all comes in and if you just put it into the system as it came in it would be very poor from the public point of view mm -hmm. so i'm just wondering when i know there are some checking built into bods but i'm not you know if people if if the data consumers and the app providers take what's in bods and then transform it into um useful hopefully useful applications down the line it, it could it could be there could be lots of errors in there that mm -hmm. that are then magnified for across you know the whole of, of wherever the data gets made visible so that's yeah. just something because checking is is a is a is a boring job but it, it i've found that it has to be done and and mm -hmm. the the operators aren't always on board with having the time or the resource to, to do that because yeah yeah so yeah, being, um, uh, sorry yeah, Tim, were you going to um, Okay, thank no, you. you. Um, <laughs> um, so, and, and actually, Peter, Peter might have a couple of points he wants to chip in as well. Um, but I think, um, so Mike, I think that's a really great question that you ask. And I suppose there's a couple of points to note. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, BODS is um, a repository for data. Um, and so we can legally require operators to publish data. We can encourage them to publish high quality data and give them the tools and, and eventually look at the financial incentives that we can link to quality of data. And um, we don't have any legislative mandate about the quality of data um, that's provided. And unfortunately, when you legislate for something, you can drive quite perverse behavior. In some instances, if somebody feels like they have to do something um, and have to do it by a set date and they don't have the resources to do it, so smaller operators. Um, you, you, know, you can absolutely foresee a world where there may be data quality issues and so that's why even though we don't have a legislative mandate around quality we are very focused on quality um, and so there's a couple of things um, so uh, you know, two, there's two levels in BODS you've got a validator which just checks is it a compliant file and then you've got a data quality managed service and um, the file has to go through the data quality managed service and it runs about 20 tests um, so looking at the most commonly found errors um, in a timetable um, file, so for example, missing stops um, is one of those tests, um, and we can certainly um, provide more information on the full range of tests if that's helpful. Um, so the the operator will be provided with a browser-based report um, that highlights the the the, the, um, the, the errors um, or the observations that have been um seen in in that data set and then the, op the operator is given an opportunity to correct those observations or whatever so they can identify which ones are false positives um so actually you, sometimes you've got express services and it's identified that there are stops that are missing and actually they're, they're not missing stops it's just an express service um and then identify which ones are actually genuinely issues that need to be addressed um, and they'll have an opportunity to do that before they actually publish their data into that live environment so that's really the, the first safeguard and um, I think there's, there's there's another layer to this which is, you know I mentioned earlier that the team are developing the agent mode functionality for BODS and that gives local authorities um, the the option so for example Nick talked to us about Hertfordshire before who are about to move to an enhanced partnership scheme and they may well want to actually take on publishing responsibility if you you know if any of the local authority areas move into franchising 
then they will um, actually take on the legal, the legal mandate to, to publish that data for the operator. And so agent mode is, you know, really important enabling feature for some of the new schemes um, that have come through the bus services act and, and, and enabling local authorities to perform functions on behalf of operators. But actually there may just be some local authority areas where you've got, for example, a lot of small operators um, and so um, there, there is, the local authority just has a really good relationship with those smaller operators and has a vested interest in making sure that the data is um, of the highest quality it can be. So there's another opportunity there for the local authorities to take a much stronger role if they wish to, um, but we certainly won't, won't require that. Um, and then I think going forward into the future, um, the, the, the other really important thing here is, is that um, we are doing two things. Um, so we are looking at, as we um, consider what we do with BSOG, when we, when, I suppose when we get past coronavirus and COVID, um, that there's BSOG reform, um, the, the longer rate of BSOG reform. And so there was much talk about us potentially having an uplift that was linked to data quality. Um, and so it goes beyond simple data provision. And then the other, um, I suppose, important point to note is that during the transitional period, we will be providing um, yeah, essentially a service to data consumers to give them an integrated transit model. And that will actually um, take the data from BODs. It will augment it with any missing data so that we've got complete national data sets, particularly for timetables. Um, and um, a correct thing, so look at things like deduplication, um, and, and you know, where, there, where there's missing data, et cetera. And, and so just really making sure that the data consumers have got quite a comprehensive and a complete offer from day one, whilst we actually iron out those creases during that transitional period, during those first two years. And then we'll see where we get to um, and, 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 and how the data consumers are working with that. So, so I think they're really good points that you raise. Um, and um, you know, thanks for, for asking that question and give us an opportunity to respond to that. Um, and that, that uh, hopefully that gives you some assurances that it is very much um, on our minds about data quality and, and um, an important part of the, the overall um, vision. Yeah, thank you. I think I think Peter wanted to say something. Yeah, well, <laughs> is that all right, Tim? Uh, I mean, it, obviously the data quality reports at the moment are only seen by the operators and. Um, <laughs> Um, I mean it, that 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 might 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 change, but it, and of course there's no requirement for the operator to do other than than tick the box to say they've uh, sort of acknowledged it. Um, they don't have to actually then correct anything in there. So and nobody will yeah. see the fact that they haven't done that. Um, but of course, I suppose there's another line to take as well in that. Um, there's a there's a lot idea of quality reports at a just sort of a minimum level um uh, uh, because sort of they're sort of binding on everybody and um, is sort of getting everybody up to the the lowest uh, sort of standard there's then another aspect of quality is that it's the operator who really wants to to see the richness of of reporting um which to another operator would seem just to be um you know far too many reports or or whatever particularly if their data was poor so there's a there's a there's a, often in these areas of quality there's this this um this area of those who 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 really are interested and want to improve their quality so so mm -hmm. i suppose the question is whether whether it does this become um something i mean for example of course the local authorities can't at the moment the transport authorities can't see these reports either so is this something that is going to be exposed more by the fact that people will download the data and put it into separate quality systems and uh, and reporting operators may have their own um or uh, or is it something that's going to be part of the sort of central process to to expose mm. that to a greater degree mm. yeah okay does that okay. tackle it mike yes well I, I, it certainly it certainly shows it's it, it's 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 on the agenda and that that transit mm. model thing sounds like um it, it's that's that's something that's that's working on, on on the lines of what we what, what we need to move forward so yeah thank you okay good okay Any can more? i just make one quick final point yeah 
and um, um, so, so I think the point piece is raised is absolutely right that at the moment the data quality reports are only viewable by the operators and we agreed that with the operators to give them a period of grace um, to, to really get to grips with the service with the publishing flows and to address data quality issues and I think it's absolutely planned that those will be made available to data consumers in the longer term and we'll also think about how else we, we surface and, and help data consumers become increasingly aware of um, you know, data sets that we believe are high quality in BODs and also the data sets that maybe are, are, are um, less high quality. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so, Naptan, um, last time we heard from uh, from Giuseppe on, uh, on what he's doing since then, um, there's been there's an opportunity out in the market to be involved in the um, in the next stages of, of development of that project. Um, so uh, if you're a supplier, um, you might want to uh, to have a look at digital marketplace um, for that. Um, one of the interesting things that's that's happened since the last time we met. Um, is that they've made their open Naptan checking system um, open source. So that's now on GitHub. Um, so that starts to expose some of the tools that, that they're using to look at data quality. Um, and on the back of that, Passenger have made their tool um, open as well. So you can get the source for that. So if you want to try and replicate what they've been doing with uh, looking at data, then um, uh, that will help more people look at data with the, some, you know, with a quality, um, quality a, view, a view on quality. So uh, I see that as a very positive move. Um, Mary, you're muted still. Sorry, um, well done. Um, so Tim and um, Giuseppe's team have actually um, so they've given me a few slides actually if you would I, I think oh, if, yeah. if there isn't time we can happily just share them around but um, I think it's just on the open Naptan um, service that they demoed the other day and um, so I'm happy to run through those if you've got a minute um, but if not I'm happy to just send them by email. We're, we're, we're running out of time so if you send them to me then we can uh, mm. then I can circulate them. Yeah that's fine. Yeah um and the other one is um been doing some work looking at um the stop announcement name for accessible information on vehicles so this would appear on a on a screen and be announced to passengers um for every stop um we did have a paper to patek at the end of last year that um pointed towards the need to uh to to identify in current Naptan fields, what date, what what field would be used for that? Yes, in an ideal world, we would create a new one, or we would move to NetEx, where there is a um, structure to support this. But we have to, we've got Naptan, and we have to live with it. Um, and so, um, short common name was identified as um, the, uh, the 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 suspect to use for that. Um, and so um, at the moment, there's only um, 86,000 um, short common names populated um, out of a total of 373,000 um, bus stops in that town. So there's quite a lot of empty um, data. Um, interestingly, um, there's only 50,000 full length common names that are over 19 characters which is sort of the size that it's going to need to be to fit on a on, on most displays so actually there's not that much of a problem um quite a lot of the um common names actually are longer than the short uh, quite a lot of the short common name fields that are populated um, actually are longer than the common name fields, um, which is a bit bizarre. Um, but um, when you look at that, um, <laughs> actually a lot of those are in Wales, 
Um, and so um, it's been, it looks to be being used as an alternative um, language um, field rather than using the, uh, the proper language structures. Um, but um, once you apply some of the standard abbreviations like getting rid of street and making it ST and things like that, actually there's only about 36,000 stops where there's a, where there's a naming problem. Um, so that doesn't feel like an insurmountable problem. Um, and so the next step is to look at actually, how do we go about addressing those um, with authorities? Um, and is there something else that we might be able to do that's more automated? Um, so what's the process from here on in? Peter, yeah. Can I just remind you, is that short common name going to uh, reconcile with the locality to into one name or is the locality going to be separate? I'm just um, thinking of all the, all the common names at our bus station or... Uh... Yeah, so um, that's one of the challenges um, for the naming, but actually if you think about most local bus services, um, let's put express services to one side, actually announcing that the next stop is bus station is actually probably the right thing to be doing for those. It's only when you get express services where actually library or bus station may not be the best thing and so actually for express services or longer distance services you might actually want to do something that says it's it's the village like you know the village name library or something like that so um so it's likely to be that express services are able to do something slightly different more appropriate for them but you know the 98 percent of of local bus services that are running around will just use this. Um, Thank so, you for the reminder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm looking for um, volunteers to to do some work on what's the best route from here with the um, 36,000 stops that need some tweaking. Um, I have a volunteer, but uh, but me and somebody else is is not potentially um, that representative. So, uh, so if anybody else wants to uh, to get involved, then uh, let me know. Um, we will need to be doing the work in August, um, so um, it's not going to drag out too long. Um, so, yeah, volunteers on a postcard or an email, please. Any questions on that? No, okay. Nobody's um, raised anything new. Okay. Oh, Nick, hello. So yeah, I just had a quick point on that, which um, uh, so for if they're for announcements, does that mean that you're sort of doing things like expanding abbreviations like saint and road and things like that, which might be in the written name into a form that a text to speech will pick up, or or are you assuming a, a, an intelligent text to speech engine using the announcement text? Uh we are going to we are having to assume that there is some intelligence and and um the suppliers that i've talked to about these things say that they can that they can do that so i don't think it's unreasonable to expect that you know if somebody's got uh a, an rd that a system's not gonna is just gonna go rd it's gonna actually go road so we have done okay, some so, but, diligence on that. Okay, I just just wanted to clarify that, and it's it, but, but what that does say is you should aim to be you, making sure you keep to a sort of consistent set of abbreviations, at, as it's set out in that term for, for where, where abbreviations are being used, so that someone can apply that intelligence. Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and the list that I'm presuming you came up with 
um, originally. Um, for that, Tan seems to, uh, to to sort things out pretty nicely. Okay. Any more? Okay. Okay. Um, um, Tim, just one question. Um, I the Siri VM profile, which you talked about earlier. Where can we access what that profile is? Because I don't seem to have a copy of that. I've just been having a look. Um, no, you won't do. Um, okay. So um, that 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 list, um, I'll circulate. Well, I'll put on the PTIC website later today and circulate um, by email. Um, that list has been circulated. Uh, to a number of different places through things like Artig and um, through uh, Operator Digital Initiative and things like that. So hopefully none of it's a surprise, but there isn't a profile document yet. That's what will be coming out uh, very soon. No, okay, no, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Mm. Um, nobody's raised any issues um, to to add on to the to the log. Um, and so um, that leads us to um, the next meeting um, will be uh, early October to bring us in line with um, the normal cycle. Um, I suggest that that's probably still best done virtually, uh, even looking that far out. Um, we get a good turnout um, this way. Um, we get more people turning up than we do face to face because of the travel costs and time, um, I guess. So we'll schedule that for early October. Um, in the meantime, we will have something on NAPTAN um, with um, Giuseppe's team who are wanting to do something um, back end of August, early September sort of time. Um, once they've uh, Finish some of their uh, current um, work. Um, so uh, there will be something going on in between. Um, has anybody got any other business? No. Okay. In which case, thank you all. Thank you for your input and participation. And uh, see you uh, next time. Okay.